Welcome to the second evening of the superintendent candidate uh, second round interviews for superintendent. If we could rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Mr. Middlestat, if you could take attendance, please. Ms. Berkmeyer. Here. Mr. Moses. He is excused. Mr. Green. Here. Ms. Knox. Here. Mr. Richards. Here. Mr. Daru. Here. Mr. Middlestat, Egham County. Thank you. So on behalf of the Board of Education of Anchor Bay School District, I'd like to welcome back uh, Mr. John Dean for the second round interview. Mr. Dean is the Deputy Superintendent for Educational Services for Gross Point Public Schools. I'll just remind of our format for tonight. This interview could be up to 60 minutes long. There are 16 questions. And towards the end of the interview time permitting, we will give an opportunity to ask questions of the board again and make closing remarks. And we will also indicate if time is becoming an issue during the responses. Uh, audience feedback can be submitted electronically by using the link provided. Although the task of choosing our next superintendent is the responsibility of the Board of Education, as the elected representatives of our community, we value and consider the input of our stakeholders in the process. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. Dean, since deciding to become a candidate and participating in first round interviews, what have you learned about our district and what has reinforced your aspiration to be our next superintendent? Whew, a sense of relief. I was thinking you might start with that sort of question, so I'm kind of ready. So you spent you know, an hour and a half with me before, so you kind of know some things about me. So I'm gonna start in a strange place. I'm actually gonna start an interview with an apology. Maybe it seems kind of strange, but bear with me. I know that being a superintendent is something you have to be all in with, and I am all in, and part of being all in is my partner in my life, my wife, is all in with me, and you might have noticed before she was with me previously. Unfortunately, she's not here today, and I want to apologize on her behalf for her absence, but I want to explain it. She wanted to be here desperately, but in addition to being married to John Dean, Anchor Bay superintendent candidate, she's also a parent to Noah Dean, Gross Point North junior track runner, and Gross Point North is running against Gross Point South tonight. Like that is the big thing in the world of track and dad is missing it, I'm here. Like I thought that was the right decision, but Sally's there. So I apologize for her not being here, I, but I know with your commitment to extracurricular and co-curricular activities, I imagine and you're also all parents, you can nod your head and think, okay, that's reasonable. So I wanted to start with that apology. In terms of why, like what do I know? I think your question was along the lines of, what, what, want to say it again, Mrs. Berkmeyer, just one more time so I can make sure to get there. Um, after becoming a candidate and interviewing, what have you learned about our district and has reinforced your aspiration to be our superintendent? Thought there was learned in there, thank you. First, obviously, thank you for picking me last week to come forward today. And thank you for the opportunity to get to meet a bunch of people from Anchor Bay. So I got to spend four hours today with four different groups of people. And I wanna answer your question about what have I learned. I wanna, do you mind if I give you a quick recap of what I learned from each of the groups? And you might go to yourself, wow, that makes no sense to me. Or maybe if I do this right, you'll be like, oh, that makes some sense, okay? So what did I learn? I started with the students. And you have great students and we had some fun conversations. I got to learn what HOSA was. I had no idea what HOSA was other than he used to play for the Red Wings, okay? But they spell it differently here, okay? It obviously means your health organization. They try to explain that piece to me. I got to meet a bunch of students that are passionate and like, like most high school students, they wanna talk about what is interesting or important to them. And we had this really interesting conversation. I wish we'd had more time. They started talking about how they see a need here and they feel like the most passionate students tend to be their female students and the male students aren't as passionate and they wanted to talk about why and how to fix that. That wasn't me that brought that, but like that came out of the conversation. 
And I'm just sharing it because it was really interesting to hear their ideas about why something was the way it was. And so I got to learn about the passions of the anchor bay kids, okay? Then we went to the administrators and I've been on that other side when that superintendent possible candidate is you know, coming to meet with the administrator group. That is almost always the most awkward conversation because the reality is the superintendent's gonna be their direct boss, has the most opportunity to change their life you know, a superintendent can't really change the life of a high schooler very much directly, and they can't really change the life of a community member. But when it comes to administrators, they can. So there was some natural trepidation and pause, some pause and some nervousness there. I think we had a great conversation. They really wanted to talk about things like enrollment, how to stem enrollment loss. They wanted to spend a lot of time talking about roles, both their roles because they're not sure where it stands. Like I think some in the district, but also like if the new superintendent comes, like how's that role definition gonna look? They talked a lot about roles of administration, roles of the staff, roles of the board. I got to understand they have a lot of uncertainty in that area. That doesn't make them right. It doesn't make them wrong, but it was interesting to hear that piece. I then got to meet with the staff, had a really good conversation with about, I think there were 13 or 14, mostly teachers, but not exclusively teachers in the room got to meet Jamie and I had heard lots of things about her for some people that we both mutually know. And I'll tell you, your staff, primarily your teachers, because that's what was there, so I'm using the word teachers, they are passionate. They care a lot about this place. They care a lot about the kids in this district. I would also tell you one of the words I used to describe it was frustrated. They are frustrated at what they see as a lack of process and a lack of inclusivity, like bringing people together. And they're curious about their role inside of this. Okay. It was really interesting for me to learn about that. They really want to partner. They want to be part of the solution. And like every employee group, they got a list of things they think are part of the problem. And they're probably they're right on a lot of their problems, but they want to be part of the solution. So we actually had some solution-based conversations. And then I met with some community members. It was a smaller group of people, but words that I came to mind were proud, committed, concerned. You know, they're very proud. I met this one woman who has been, she talked to me about how she's been Anchor Bay her whole life and she's raised her family here and her grandkids go here and she is committed to this community and she has a vision for what this community was and is and she wants to see it grow. And so she has questions about what that's gonna look like. I tell you though, there's some overarching themes amongst all of them. They want someone, I forgot to have my mask on. <laughs> they want someone that can bring people together. They feel, I sense from all the groups, some level of faction or like they're trying to figure out where they fit in the scheme, I would say they would include you too. They're trying to figure out what's the role of the board, what's the role of us as an employee, what's the role of us as a community member, but they all care about coming to a solution. They all want to get to unity because no one wants to be in a spot with uncertainty or nerves or anything along those lines and they all want to get to that space. And to answer your question, how do I think that matches with my interests? I talked to you before, I'm committed to relationships that I think resonated with those groups of people. I'm committed to process, to build trust. Every single group talked about trust. How do you build trust? And I spoke with them just like I spoke with you last week about coming to mutual agreement about what we should do. And then we go ahead and we do that thing. And that is how you build trust. And I believe that resonated with all the groups. And then this idea that we need as an organization, as a school district, to make sure we're spending our time talking about our little ones and what's best for kids versus adult stuff and what's best for adults. Now, I know there's often an alignment and what's best for adults is best for kids. I understand that. And if you're board members, I'm an administrator. Hopefully, you're next superintendent. We're going to talk a lot about adult stuff. But they are committed to figuring out how do we make kid-focused decisions. So I walked away <laughs> that I was a good match and my interests were a good match for the Anchor Bay Schools. Well, John, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, my question to you, sir, is how do you cultivate commitment to a vision rather than compliance in your correct team, your current team? I think the simplest and the honest direct answer is it's not my vision, it's our vision. If I bring the vision, whether it's in my current role in my current district or as the new super bank, superintendent in Anchor Bay, then it will be about compliance. It isn't good enough to ask John Dean or any other candidate 
what do you want for Anchor Bay? That's important. Like, I think you should ask me, and I think you kind of have. But at the end of the day, what I say isn't the right answer or the best thing. It's the process we put in place to bring collective vision so everyone feels like it's their vision. No one wants to be John's vision. No one wants to be the board's vision or the president's vision or the, you know, the ABEA's vision. It needs to be this collective vision so we can all be there together. We build it together. We set up accountability and markers for how we know what it's gonna look like once we've implemented it. So if our vision is every kid learns every day, or you, know, you have a, your vision right now, educational excellence together, that's a good vision. But what does that look like? What does educational excellence together look like if I work in the transportation department? What does that look like if I'm at one of the elementary schools that might close? What does that look like if I'm a board member? I think we need to have some pretty specific things that are developed so we know what excellence looks like. And then, then that can be a collective vision versus my vision or the board's vision. Because if it's my vision or your vision, it's just on this piece of paper. And it needs to be something that we're living every day. And we do that by making it our vision. Uh, good evening, Mr. Dean. I got, as you look back over your career, what achievement are you most proud of? I am going to give you one from the very beginning of my career. And hopefully you don't take that to mean that like, yeah, he's giving me an example from year two and he's 26 years in. Please don't view that as 24 years of failure. Okay, if you do, I suppose, then we don't see each other again. But I'm gonna give you one that I am most proud of and I'm gonna go back to my class time as a classroom teacher. Um, I was hired um, to work at Osborne High School in Detroit Public Schools, it's the corner of seven at Hoover. When I was there, it was 2,800 kids. Um, at the time, um, predominantly at risk, um, urban high school, any way that you wanna measure what an urban high school looks like. And here I am, this math teacher, 22, I had ponytail and an earrings, okay? I, there's some pictures of that, it's kind of funny. I had more hair back then, so it looked okay. At least I think so. And I was this math teacher and I was loving it. And I was seeing, I was connecting with kids. And we had some kids that I was teaching that I saw had some real talent around mathematics. They had a passion for it and an interest in it. But at that high school at that time, we had a very linear, you went to algebra, the next year you went to geometry, you went to algebra two, you went to pre-calculus because there were potentially four years. So there's four years of math. And that meant those kids had no pathway to calculus. And we know that calculus for somebody that's committed to like arts, like the science and engineering field, like getting calculus in high school is important. You did that already here because you offer AB, AB, AP calculus. Like, you know that, right? And so one of the things that I talked to my department chair about was, We've got this group of kids that were ninth graders. How can we get them to calculus? And we talked about that. And we decided we needed to come up with a double up strategy. And so in math, that meant we, as sophomores, would help those kids take both geometry and algebra two simultaneously. So then they could take pre-calculus as juniors and calculus as seniors. And we were able to do that for 30 kids. And I taught, I, we identified them in my first year and then the next two years, I taught the double block portion of it. So one year I taught, both year, one year I taught, both years I taught the advanced algebra two section of that for those sophomores that were electing two sections of math. And while my career went a different way and I had a different opportunity and then I moved to Algonac, moving meaning career wise, when those kids took calculus as seniors, that's the best thing I've done in my career. That was really exciting to me and I'm still proud of that moment. Thank you. Good evening. Competition to public schools in the form of schools of choice, charters, private schools, and online programs is increasing. How, in your opinion, can we remain the top option for families in this competitive marketplace? I saw it today. You've got great resources. You have exceptional teachers. You've got exceptional kids. I didn't meet many of them, but you, I imagine you have exceptional parents. I know I'm staring at a group of them up here. The single most significant selling point Anchor Bay Schools has is the people and the product it's already providing. Marketing is like any other form of improvement. You can always do it better. You can always do it more. I had lots of conversations today that came up 
about the concern, and you know this concern, this concern of enrollment loss. And we know that Mr. Richards kind of buried, not buried, but like in that question is this element of competition and there's this enrollment loss question that every district, including Anchor Bay, is, is kind of struggling through. And I think we need to have a targeted strategy talking about every kid that's left this district. Who's left? We know that. We should know that. Every principal should know who are the kids that were in your school last year that aren't in your school this year. I'm not talking about the kids that graduate out age-wise. I'm talking about like the kids who were third graders last year and didn't come back in fourth grade. Why'd they move? Where'd they go? If they're still in the Anchor Bay area, I mean, if they moved to Grand Rapids, we know why they're not here, right? But if they're still in the same neighborhood, but they're no longer choosing Anchor Bay schools, what have we done to make, to make it clear we invite them back, we encourage them back? So we've got that group of people, which are our past clients that we are no longer serving. So how do we make it clear that we want them back? How are we managing direct competition with our partner, not our partners, but our neighbor districts we get with regard to schools of choice? We know because of the geographic situation in Anchor Bay, you're not competing in schools of choice with many districts. You're competing really with the districts that are geographically you know, neighboring districts. So it's Lands Cruz, East China, Algonac, and I know you touched little bits of New Haven, or some, not little bits, but a piece of New Haven, and then Richmond's not too far away. But you know that's your primary competition. So if you are actively looking to grow your schools of choice population, how are you marketing that? Have you decided and have you analyzed what's the best and point of entry? What's your most compelling argument to come join Anchor Bay? It's probably when the kids are young because they're less committed to the district they're at now you get to keep them longer and grow them into that Anchor Bay tradition so they can be TARS and do all those sorts of things. Also, frankly, you get them when they're a second grader and you get FTE for them for 10 years versus if you get them for a junior and you get them for two years. We'll take them as a junior. We'd love them as a, as a second grader and keep them the whole time. Competition, have you looked carefully at the kids that you're losing to private and parochials? Have you not just invited them back, but why'd they leave? So if somebody tells you, I'm gone, I'm never coming back. I, I wanna know why. Have we done an exit survey? What's the primary reason? Are they dissatisfied with the teaching quality? Are they dissatisfied with class sizes? I and mean, people that are angry and are leaving you for a reason are typically pretty happy to tell you the reason. And I'd wanna know what that reason is so we can both work on our messaging or maybe we see there's a problem. I don't know, is it, are you losing kids at one particular, I'm making this up, elementary school at one particular grade level? I don't know. I'd wanna know the answer to that question. The answer might be no, like it might, it might be general and broad and not narrow, but I'd wanna know, is it narrow? If it's narrow, is it something we can do about? Are you losing, for example, kids going from let's say fifth to sixth grade? If that was the case, I'd wanna know what are you doing in sixth grade that's different than your peers that might be getting those kids and how could you make some adjustments if necessary, whether that's adjustments on the marketing side, adjustments on the delivery side. When we talk about gaining enrollment, have you looked at shared time? I know you do some shared time. Could you do some more shared time? Could you look at structuring that in a different way to try to capture more FTE in an appropriate way that increases your bottom line? Because it's quite possible when you add shared time kids, it frankly can end up being resources that you can really spend here to support your core programming. So those are all things that come to mind when I think about, you know, it's not hard to sell this place. You got a great community. Look at your facilities. Look at the quality of your staff. Like you can sell that, like that's, an, I'm not in sales. I'm not wired that way. I'm, I'm a cheerleader, but I'm not in sales. But I think you've got a good product to sell. You're not selling a jalopy here. Like you're selling a great car to use the analogy. And man, that sometimes sells itself, but you got to still market it well. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. What basic philosophies do you have regarding collective bargaining and what do you believe the role of the superintendent should be in the process? I'm gonna take those and I'm gonna make sure not to miss either side because I think those are both important parts to that question. My philosophy my philosophy for collective bargaining is the same as working with the board, and it's the same as working with any other group of people. Honesty, transparency, no surprises, directness. I talked to you last week 
about how if I became your superintendent, I'd expect there to be no surprises and you need to suspect, expect the same thing from me, at least publicly. I'd tell you collective bargaining is exactly the same way. You can ask every group that John Dean has ever bargained with or for, and they would say, you know what, he does what needs to get done. And sometimes in collective bargaining, it's messy, right? Most often you hope it isn't, but it can get there. But man, I didn't surprise people. If there was a hard message, if I went in a closed session and the board gave me a direction that I knew was gonna be hard, but like, I know it's my job to do that, right? I don't get to pick the direction. I can advise, but at the end of the day, the board picks the direction. I don't come to the bargaining table next time and just drop it in the room like an elephant and walk away. I'm calling my union president. I'm normally in a functional world, pre-COVID. I would have a regular once a month or so lunch with the union president where we just meet off the record. We alternate who's paying for the club sandwiches. And we sit down and we just talk about what's going on. And I would sit down and say, hey, Mike, or hey, Laura, or hey, Sherry, or hey, Chris, those are my past union presidents. This is what's going on. This is what I'm thinking. We'd build that relationship. We wouldn't have surprises. Hopefully we've built a great enough relationship that we can be just honest with each other. You know, I had a question today with the employees. Um, one of the employee groups said, how long do you think collective bargaining should last? Then I said, formally, as briefly as possible. Informally, it's a year round event. You know, you're not bargaining your contract all year, but you're forming relationships all year and you're implementing your contract all year long. I am a passionate believer in transparency. Like we're preparing for bargaining in our district. My union president asked for a whole bunch of information. I was confused by a couple of his requests. I could have played the game of giving him what I thought he wanted and like dragged it out, if that makes some sense. Forget that. I called Chris, said, Chris, let's get on a Zoom. Let me ask you some questions. I narrowed down exactly what he was looking for. We were able to provide it to him because you know what? He just needs information to make good decisions. I got the information where the district, why would I jam him up? It like, makes no sense, it doesn't help anybody. But at the end of the day, both sides have to be ready and have to be willing. I mean, I've had, there's one bargaining unit to this day in our school district, bargaining is a one session event. We get together, it's an MEA group for what it's worth. We get together and it's typically a one session event. We meet one time and we're done. Right now in our school district, bargaining with the teachers takes appreciably longer than that. That doesn't make it bad, but it's really where it needs to be right now and it's where they want it to be. At some point, potentially we can get it to be briefer again. I'd like it to be. Ms. Knox, you actually asked a second question. What's the superintendent's role? I think that's a conversation you have to have with the Board of Education. And you gotta figure out what role you want your superintendent to play. If you hire me, you're hiring somebody that's been the chief negotiator for like 13 years and has, I think, a lot of experience in that area. But typically I would tell you, I'm not a huge fan of the superintendent being the chief negotiator because it makes it very easy to vilify the messenger and that can get very problematic. And sometimes bargaining can get personal and you don't, you need to keep your superintendent above the fray, typically. I would also tell you, I would, strongly encourage board members not to be part of bargaining for exactly the same reason. I know every district also has to make decisions about who's on their bargaining team. I tend to be a fan of a representative bargaining team of administrators, but not every administrator in the kitchen sink. And then every district has to make the tactical decision of do they have an attorney involved or not. I've done it both ways. I think it can be successful both ways. Um, but that really comes down to cultural comes down to the intent of the board. It comes down to the intent. I mean, like if, you know, if, for example, if you, if we wanted to explore not having an attorney at the table, we need to have a conversation with Jamie. We, that's probably means probably me and figure out, okay, Jamie, where do you see this going? You know, so one of the advantages is I know Mara works. I've worked with Mara for a while in different capacities when she was a Uniserve director and Mara and I get along pretty darn well but also she can be tough as nails. And I'd say that if she was sitting right next to me and she would respond, yeah, John can be tough as nails too. So like one of the questions becomes like, what are you looking for? At this district, what would I recommend? And now I'm giving you a long way to the answer, but what the heck, it's my last chance. I'm gonna give it to you anyway. I sensed from the teachers, a lot of frustration. I sensed from the teachers, a desire to have an interrupt of the process and try to get to some culture reset. You might, Maybe I'd have to play some role, although hopefully you get the collective bargaining agreement done before I start. So maybe there's no role for me to play, right? But you might have to have me help a little bit more than I typically want to just because of some skill sets. 
but I don't think you're hiring me to be your chief negotiator. You need to hire the right person in the organization. If you don't have the right person, we need to find the right person. I think it is hard for the superintendent to fill that role long-term. Can I do it? Sure, I think I can do it well, but I don't know that long-term is the best play. It might be the short-term play though, and I'd be happy to do it. I've come into bargaining before and fixed stuff. We can do it. Sorry for the long-winded answer. I got, I got started. <laughs> Okay, many new theories, innovations, and philosophies have been introduced into education delivery in the last decade. What new idea do you feel has been the most effective in improving learning over the last decade? Sorry, Mr. Smith, you can't see me, but I was trying to write that question down. No, I can, I, I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take liberty. I'm going to give you two answers for what, what, what thing or what innovation has most impacted improving learning. The first thing I'll tell you is a focus on differentiation, in particular in the elementary classroom. We have really moved through the use of guided reading, guided writing, guided math, and I know your district does versions of each of those things. How can we use flexible small grouping to meet a student at their current learning need you know, when I was a kid, and I imagine most of you were kids, and we flash back to first and second grade, at most there were two groups of readers. There were probably the bluebirds and the cardinals, and they basically did most of the same things, but they would be bluebirds and cardinals all year long. By the way, I was a bluebird. That's the lower one, and that's okay, right? I turned out okay, even though I was a bluebird and couldn't fly as well as a cardinal. And they stayed in that spot. We know now that especially for our youngest learners, they are not learning, learning growth is not linear, okay? I know for one of my kids, personal children, Alex, my Alex jumped multiple reading levels in the space of eight weeks that made no sense when she was like in January of her first grade year. The only reason it made sense is she had an awesome teacher and Mrs. Fellows. Her learning was not linear, linear. If she had started out as a bluebird and been stuck in that spot, she would have never made it, but they used flexible grouping guided reading and recognizing that all our kids that are first graders that are all six are not in the same spot. And it's fungible and regular, move, regularly moving based on feedback we get from assessments. That's probably the single biggest innovation. And I know it doesn't sound exciting and it doesn't have a button and like it doesn't have a, like a fancy name, but I'll tell you it's made the single biggest difference in our young learners. The second thing is the role that technology plays in learning, not the tool. I'm not particularly excited about a computer or like a computer that goes fast or a computer that goes slow. I am much more interested in the role that technology plays inside of the learning. And we're seeing a lot of that during the time of COVID. One of the things I was excited to learn today was you use Schoology and we have Schoology in our district as our learning management system as well. So I'm very familiar with how can we leverage that as a tool to improve learning. So like, I have some questions about how you use Schoology. Have you figured out a systematized way that teachers present their content online? Or when your kid has six teachers, do they have six different ways that it looks? Okay, I think that's like a spot we can maybe do some work in. I think we can talk about, you know, we had some conversation with one of the groups, I think it was the administrative group, like what role does the computer play in the classroom? And I kind of flipped the question and I said, how do you think technology could be used in your classroom to leverage learning for kids? And I think that needs to be the question. If actually their question was like, how do you handle internet capacity? And I just said, I don't know. How do you wanna use the internet? Like, what are you looking for your kids to be able to do that? And I think technology can really change how the learning looks inside of the classroom. And I guess that would be the second big innovation. And I think COVID and the pandemic has forced us to do more of that quicker. And some of that has good results and some has bad results, but most of it's been good. Thanks. Uh, what protocols, activities, or strategies have you employed to ensure that everyone's voice is heard and valued? You have to have intentional engagement. I've talked to you before about we can't be a high functioning administrative team with the school board unless we have personal relationships. And I would take it a step further. I can't be a great superintendent if I'm not available and intentionally trying to work with people. So, you know, there are things specifically that I would need to do inside of this community, especially as an outsider. How do I make myself available beyond, there's easy stuff to do, go to buildings, come to a staff meeting, all those sorts of things, and I'll do those sorts of things. But what are the points inside of the community 
where I can make a difference and meet people. So I don't know in Anchor Bay, whether it's the Rotary or the Lions or the Kiwanis or what group it is, maybe it's all those groups, maybe it's none of those groups, but what's the, what's the leverage point that I could be part of to make those connections? What's the, what's the points in this district where you get a lot of community members together? I know some of the easy ones, right? Like whenever Anchor Bay High School plays Lance Cruz North in football, I imagine you get a lot of community members there, right? So that's an obvious one to be part of, but what are some other kind of low hanging fruit opportunities to meet with people? I would tell you in this community, especially as the new person, I need to know what is the coffee shop, what is the restaurant that once a month would be happy to be come and sit in the corner and be there for an hour every other Monday. And anybody in the community who wants to chat with the superintendent can just wander in, sit down. I'm not a coffee drinker, I'll have my orange juice or water. I mean, because by the way, this amount of speed talking and hyperactivity wouldn't work with coffee, like that'd be a bad mix, okay? Um, but like that sort of intentionality so Mrs. Berkman, one of the challenges I have as an outsider is I don't know what those points are. So I'd be coming to you as board members and you in the community. You know, do we have standing monthly meetings or bi-monthly meetings with our union presidents? I think that's a good idea. I think not from a purpose of collective bargaining, but like to know what's going on inside of the district. I mean, am I organizing and facilitating those sorts of things? What does the board committee structure look like? I mean, all those sorts of, the point is it needs to be intentional. We need to figure out what are some intentional ways that within a year, John Dean can know the people, the people can know him. They all know, kind of got my cell phone number. They all know they can always meet with me. How do we make those things happen? And I, I guess it needs to be intentional is my thinking. Next question is, is mine, John. Uh, with all the variance among the county districts on face-to-face -face versus virtual learning, how do your beliefs align with what Anchor Bay has been implementing? And part two of the question is, how will you go about determining what the best approach and strategy is for us in the upcoming school year? Um, every single school district I know of has been figuring out how do we provide instruction during a pandemic? Because none of us have done it. I will tell you, there is no single district that's done it right. Like if you define right to mean getting it right all the time. Um, you know, the story in Anchor Bay is pretty darn similar to the story in Gross Point. You know, have a big, I don't know what's the right word. I can think of a word that I shouldn't say publicly at a board meeting, but have a big to do about how much face-to-face -face learning should you have in the fall? Like that you had a to-do, like for lack of a better term. We had a to-do in our district as well, okay? Because we had parents that want their kids face-to-face. -face. We also have parents that because of legitimate concerns about COVID are uncomfortable with their kids face-to-face. -face. And you have to try to balance through those sorts of things. It would have been easier, but life is not easy, especially in a pandemic, if the government had just said, you have to do this thing. Like then you could have all said, I don't like it, but you'd have to comply with it, okay? Similar to almost kind of what happened last March, right? We all had to shut down for a period of time and then it became like all year, almost governmentally enforced. And that was easier, but this year we've had ambiguity and every district's been able to do its own thing. So how do I align with you? You've been trying to provide face-to-face -face instruction for families that want it. And that is something that we've been doing the same thing in Gross Point, doing it in fits and starts and figuring out how to do it best. You've made some choices, similar to some of the choices we made in Gross Point, that have impacted almost negatively some of the learning going on inside of your learning spaces. You're trying to pull off a duality, especially at the secondary level, where you're trying to provide instruction simultaneously to kids face-to-face -face while kids are also remote in the same setting. My analogy for that is this. Um, if let's just say for a second, let's draw a line between Mr. Richards and Mr. Daru. So Mr. Richards, Mrs. Knox, you're remote zooming into John Dean's math class. And Mr. Daru, Mr. Green, and Mrs. Berkmeyer are all face-to-face. -face. And I'm providing this instruction and I'm doing this thing. You can, three of you can see it and I can see your response and I can see your confusion and I can see you when you furrow your brow and I can respond and do these things. Mr. Richards and Mrs. Knox are watching that, but it's like looking through a window. They can hear me, but I really can't hear them. I know there are mechanics inside of Zoom where you can raise your hand and all this sort of stuff, but the reality is I'm in the moment and I'm teaching right here and you're a little bit looking through a window and that is not as good for you as it is for them. Additionally, by tethering me to this space and it is like a tether, I cannot be the type of engaging teacher that is best for pedagogy. I can't 
collectively like group people the same way because we're kind of stuck in these spaces. A, I can't group you because of COVID, but I can't even group, group you based on learning style because maybe Jill needs to be grouped with Lisa, but you're virtual and you're not, and how do we make that work? So what's happened is inside of each one of your classrooms that are doing this, it's compromised for your two people that are virtual in this example. You're also being compromised because I'm not able to use my best practices pedagogy because I'm tethered to this space. You're living that right now. And I'll tell you, how do we get out of that? I'm not 100% sure, but one of the things we did do in Gross Point, which helped us, is we did early on last year before the school year started an online virtual school. So if a family knew they wanted to be virtual for the year, they could. So in this example, if Mrs. Knox, his family had decided it'd be best for Jill to be at home this year, we would have been able to put you in an all virtual scenario where you would only be getting virtual instruction from a teacher that was just focused on virtual, if that makes some sense. You wouldn't be in class with your four other classmates up here. And Mr. Middlestad, I'm sorry. I guess you've been bad and you're in the principal's office at this point. I apologize, I didn't put you in my example. I, now I feel bad about it. That's okay, I'm really remote, so. Okay, <laughs> so I, I should have used him as my example, like being able to see it, all this sort of stuff, right? I am not here to tell you, and this came up in every single meeting, I'm not here to tell you that an online virtual school is your long-term best answer. I have some misgivings about whether that's the best answer, but like many things, not my decision. I think we need to engage with our stakeholders. You need to survey your community. What are they looking for? What are your staff looking for? You look at it through multiple ways. If you've only got 30 k 30 ninth graders that want a fully virtual world, you can't provide that because you can't in a cost-effective way, provide instruction at the high school level for only 30 kids. Like it won't work, like the math doesn't work how you divide those kids up. So I do think you need to make some choices. I think you need to make some of those, you need to make those plans now so that once you have a better idea of what COVID looks like and hopefully with the vaccine and a variety of other things, we're gonna be in a much better place. I am an advocate for face-to-face -face instruction. I think Anchor Bay and other districts have been doing that really well for a long time. And that is where we need to be long-term. Now, maybe we learn some stuff and we figure out there might be some niches where long-term virtual would make some sense, but I think those are small niches more than broad participation. How have you established a positive and constructive culture and climate in your workplace? And how would you do so here as our superintendent? I like... I like to think I've started that here already. I think that, I hope you think that I've been positive, optimistic, and very open the two times you've met with me. That's how you form a positive relationship. You know people, you're open. You're willing to admit when you screwed it up. And Lord knows you work with me, John Dean screws it up sometimes. If you ever meet somebody who tells you they didn't screw it up, they're lying to you, okay? You know, I think about it in my office. We brought together a very heterogeneous group of human beings in my office. And we've done that by having regular meetings, regular opportunities to connect. Every day I walk in, I know one of my assistants has a little two-year-old at home who's kind of like a lot of work, right? And that's okay. So I ask Kai how her son's doing and we talk through that. And then, you know, she asked me how things are going here and or, you know, my life not here in Anchor Bay. You know, it's that, it's that relationship piece. You know, I, I sensed it, I mentioned it earlier, you know, the administrators today were certainly the most reserved group. And I really believe that it's for those two reasons I mentioned that like, they're not sure what it'd be like to have a new boss. Most of them have only worked with one boss, right? Like, so a new boss is a change and that's a naturally anxiety building thing. And then because it's been rather at times interesting or maybe we use the word at times tumultuous and that's not bad to name it, right? I think naming it matters. They're just naturally a little bit nervous. And I, I think that group of people, because those are the people I'll be working with most often on a daily basis. You know, I learned some things from them that I was really curious about. I, I said to them, what do, your, what do your administrative council meetings look like? And they actually laughed and they said, we meet once a year. And I, I said, well, tell me more. Like I wanted to seek to understand why do you only meet once a year? How can you have a relationship? How can you have non-silo based work if you only meet once a year? I think you, you can't, I mean, but I didn't say it exactly. I asked some questions, right? And, and I think I learned some things. I, I asked them, well, what's your professional learning look like? Like, how have you structured your learning as a leader? And they couldn't answer that. And that's, I'm not critical of that, but man, I, I think under, under our leadership, you ask that question a year from now, the administrator's gonna be able to answer. 
You know, we, we were doing some things. One of the things we noticed in our school district around learning was our administrators were having a hard time having the hard conversation. You know, hard conversation is when the recipient isn't gonna like the news is how I think about it. So we designed some professional development. We found a great like series of short podcasts where they would go through and talk about from almost a psychological perspective, how to have hard conversations in a way that is not, I forget the word they use, it wasn't off-putting, but like where barriers go up. And so we, we listened to those in small groups. We then did some role playing and we just focused on that for a couple of our ad council meetings. It wasn't our whole meetings, but we had a little bit of that at every one of our ad council meetings for about three or four months. And that was really came from them. My administrators thought that was something, a skill set they needed. And then we go on and we look at something else. I, that's kind of what I'm thinking about as an example of forming relationships. Like how can we get on the same team? How can we have a common understanding? How can we care about the same things? I, I think it's through caring, relationship building, asking people questions and then growing together. You know, I would say to the board, how do we, you become more functional and hopefully with me as your superintendent, how do we become more functional? We have to grow together. We have to learn together. How can we get better together? You do something together. It's like any part of any other team, you know, I've been part of teams and sometimes those bonds last for my whole lifetime. Thank you. In what ways do you fit the description of a servant leader? Servant leaders seek first to understand, not to be understood. They ask questions. They assume positive intent. A servant leader assumes the best of everyone. That doesn't mean they're naive, doesn't mean they hold, don't hold people accountable, but they assume that the thing that happened or the things that happened were done for a good reason. A servant leader works with somebody to figure out what's the thing they're working on, and then they help to get that person to where they're at. So we have a, an administrator in our school district who is passionate about becoming a superintendent. He's not ready yet because he's really kind of a new principal. But he and I are talking regularly about what are the skill sets, what are the experiences he needs to become ready to be a superintendent when it's his time. I believe I'm both modeling and actually performing servant leadership with him because I'm helping him grow. As the superintendent, you can do little things. Um, one of our things in our school district, and you're dealing, every district is dealing with this, is COVID testing for athletes. Right? Like that's a thing. You have to do it under MHSAA and it's complicated, right? And this is a little thing. I am not saying it's a big thing, but it's an example. My son, as I mentioned, is a track kid. And so at Gross Point North, he has to get tested every Monday morning because that's when we do COVID testing. And we start at 6.45 in the morning. And because of his schedule, he has to like be there at the first go around. By the way, our high school doesn't start till eight. That's why we can pull off COVID testing at 6.45. And so I show up with Noah, walk in with Noah, and then I just help do the testing. You know, because we're doing the Binax testing, the nasal swab testing. So we've got a whole system of things set up. And not that I do Noah's testing, that would be unethical, like I'm his dad. But we tend to do it in groups of 50. So I come in, help set up the materials, help, you know, sign off the forms. The kid was good, get the next group out, get the softball team in, all these sorts of things. Is it a big deal? Nope. Is it a huge thing? Not at all. Who's doing the work mostly? Well, it's kids and mostly the coaches are doing there under the lead of the athletic director. But I do kind of think, you're being a servant leader when the deputy superintendent's in there next to the assistant track coach or the assistant volleyball coach or the JV baseball coach, making sure the athletes get to, do, to, get to play. You know, didn't make a big deal. It would have gotten done if I hadn't been there. But I do think narrative wise, it's exactly the thing that goes on. You know, a little quirk that I have is I tend to be the guy when walking down the hall even when I'm talking to people, I pick up the garbage in the hall and throw it in the garbage can and I don't make a deal of it, partly because I'm kind of a neat freak, but partly because I like the look. When the deputy superintendent leans over and picks up the folded piece of paper and chucks it in the garbage, it kind of makes it clear it's everybody's job. And we all got to do our part. Like that's a little thing. And if I'm helping out a custodian by picking up that one piece of paper, like man, it's the least I can do for that man or woman because they got a pretty, at times, rotten job, right? and I'm doing a tiny little thing and showing that that's a thing I can do, I think that's an example of servant leadership. Thank you. We have about 15 minutes left and about six more questions. So I just wanted to- well, I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> like that feels okay to me. Like I'm all right. 
All right. How would you reach governance team consensus when there are strong differences of opinion among members of the Board of Education and or superintendent? And how do you do so in a way that respects these differences, strengthens relationships, and helps a diverse group of individuals function as a highly effective team? I'm going to start at the there's two directions on this question. I am gonna start, I'll start at the front. That's probably chronological justice the best way. We have to figure out what is our shared vision, our shared protocols, our shared process for making decisions so that when the hard decision comes, we at least have a framework. And hopefully we develop our, this framework for making decisions around an easy decision. You know, I'll give you an example. Let me give you a real life example. Um, probably, maybe one of you will, I know I won't. Um, you know, when you get on the Supreme Court of the United States, do you know what, the, and this is always true, no matter who the Chief Justice is, your first opinion you get to write is automatically and only will be a 9-0 opinion. They want you to get your first chance of writing an opinion and going through that whole process to be something they can all stand behind together. I would encourage this board and hopefully me as your new superintendent to develop some process around some easy stuff first so then like when we're in different spaces, maybe five, four, or in this example, seven, zero, whatever it looks like, right? Then we at least have built in a common experience of having done something together process-wise. I would expect from all of you honesty. I've shared before the no surprises piece. I am passionate about we don't and we shouldn't air dirty laundry. That doesn't mean we should violate the Open Meetings Act, but there is a way and in a polite and kind in a way that validates people to say something or even to disagree in public that does not demean the other person. And we as a board and administration have to be committed to that. I would also tell you this, at the end of the day, the board makes the decision. And I, as your superintendent, am always gonna support the decision publicly as long as it's not illegal, sorry, I'm not going to jail for any of you, as long as it's not patently immoral, not something that like, like I would tell you this, we, and this is in like in my district, Rose Point right now, we're having these conversations about how much is remote learning or face-to-face -face learning the right or wrong thing, and people almost take it as like a moral stand. Is there some element of that inside of Anchor Bay? I, to some degree, like it's almost like, you know, you're right for thinking this way or you're wrong for thinking this way. I don't view that as a moral quandary question because reasonable people can come to two different conclusions about that thing. I'm talking about immoral, like if all of a sudden you as a district, you as a board of education, we're going to eliminate all of your programs for at-risk learners, not illegal. I tell you right now, that's pretty darn unethical, okay? I'd have a hard time standing with that one. And I tell you beforehand, like if, if I talked to the board president, as I was talking to board members, you all came to me and said, John, the next budget cut is we have got to get rid of every single at-risk program for kids, and we have to quadruple the budget for athletics. I would meet with each one of you and say, I'm telling you right now, I can't stand on that one. Like, I'll support you. I'll do what you need me to do. But I, that is one I'm going to struggle with, and I'm probably going to have a hard time in public, and I would do it politely, but I would say I can't support that. And I'd also tell you this, we get to that point you need a different superintendent and I need a different set of seven bosses and I can live with that one too. I don't think we get to that because you all seven seem like really reasonable people that might sometimes be in different spaces, but with process, you have this, you care about kids. You want to do what's best for the Anchor Bay community. That's what I would like to do too. I don't see an immoral thing coming our way. And then I, it goes back to surprises. I'm going to ask you not to set me up at a meeting. I'm not going to set you guys up. If the seven of you tell me, John, we've made the decision that even though you've recommended and passionately believe that it's a district we need to be one-to-one -one with devices, we as a board cannot be there and we want to remove some technology in our district, I'm going to meet with you individually and say, Lisa, I'm really disappointed with that decision. And here's my 15 reasons why I think you're wrong. And you have to like live with that, right? But then publicly, that's not coming out of my mouth. It's, I made the analogy before. This meeting is like Thanksgiving dinner. I have to be honest with my wife about what's going on in our relationship, but I don't share in front of the whole family at Thanksgiving all my complaints about the things she does right or wrong. And by the way, she doesn't do a lot of wrong things. Like it's me that does the wrong things, okay? But I, I mean that sincerely. This is Thanksgiving dinner. 
we, we got to make this thing work. Do what's best for the family, for this community, but do it in a way where we don't tear each other apart. Okay, hey, thanks. Can you please, please tell us about your experience with building strong partnerships between schools and local businesses, industry and community organizations? And what would be your approach to establish such things in Anchor Bay? That's a great question, Mr. Middlestat. One of the things, one of the, there's a couple of things. Our business, businesses in every community, including Anchor Bay, have a vested interest in the school system they are going to use those people as workers and or customers. They want, every business in Anchor Bay wants the most educated workforce possible because they'll be the best versions of employees. They will also be the best consumers with the most amount of money to purchase their products. Like there's a shared interest there. What are some specific ways that we can partner? On an individual basis, how can I be involved with service organizations, et cetera, inside of this community and inform like what, where's the place all that action sort of happens? How can we, in a community like Anchor Bay, where there is such broad passion for athletics and marching band and CTE, how can we bring organizations into those places as partnerships? I imagine you've done much of that already. How can we do more of that? We talk about CTE and all these kids we have that want, like those HOSA kids that want to be involved in the health fields, et cetera. I know from firsthand experience, we have an applied med program at Gross Point North High School and those students get to go to the doctor's office, the vet office, St. John Hospital, watch doctors, nurses, physicians assistants do those sorts of things. That's a business partnership. How are we maximizing those things in this community? Those are all different ways. That's an easier one because we have a lot of shared interests. No business wants an uneducated or non-affluent workforce. They're passionate about that just like we are. Thanks. John, in any leadership transition, there is an opportunity to amplify existing successes and challenge some of the norms that are ongoing. How we go about building on our strengths while progressively leading us to a newer, higher level? Like I said earlier today, I, I found a lot of strengths in this district. The caring, the passion, the facilities. I, I think it was Mr. Richards earlier who asked the question, like, how do we, like some version of how do we manage enrollment? And I think I responded, man, if I got to sell a district, sell in this district's easy. I've had to sell some districts, it isn't easy. This district's easy, your outcomes are outstanding. You've got great people. You know, to a person, I heard concerns from every group of stakeholders I talked to, but nobody was concerned about the quality of the people or the quality of the kids. They were just concerned about process. Every single group I saw today, it was process, transparency, how the decision gets made. You know, how the decision, that's a good way to think about it. I did not hear today about the decision that got made. I heard very few complaints about decisions that have been made in this district. I've heard concerns about how decisions have been made. That's actually a better problem than if I'd heard up for four hours today about the terrible decisions every administrator had made or this board of education had made. It was about a how, it was a process situation. I, I think, and I said it before, we need to come together. What our roles look like? What's the role of the board? I, you know, I, I heard from people, I heard from all four groups, not the students so much, because I don't think of it that way, but all three adult groups, they weren't sure that all seven board members knew what their role was. They felt that at different times, they'd had board members involved in things that probably didn't feel like the things that board members should be involved in and vice versa. There were times when I heard loud and clear that there have been administrators that have abdicated their responsibility and said, that's a board decision. And you know what? You can't have your superintendent or your central office or your building principal say, my hands are tied. The board's doing it. That is a cop out. That is, I'll rephrase my language, I'm on public TV. That is a cowardly way to be a leader. Likewise, you is so, you're never going to hear from me. I am never going to say to a community, I agree with you. But that Board of Education did that. That is not how this works. Likewise, you as a board, once we agree what your work is and our administration's work is, we've got to agree to stay in our lanes. And we've got to be open to hearing feedback. There might be times when I have to say to you politely, privately, I 
tell me why, Mr. Green, you got involved in that decision that way. You know, if we're talking about, for example, what teacher we're going to hire, I'm making it up. I'm sure you wouldn't do this, but like, I would want to know why do you as a board member think you know who should best be hired for this school district? You've hired the administrators and the people on the interview team. If I can demonstrate to you that we have a process for how we choose teachers and how we support teachers, then I would expect as a board member, you're going to support the recommendations we made about something that transparently you don't have a lot of detailed information about. If at the end of the day, we promise process around how to hire that teacher and you don't think we've provided process, ask me about the process politely, privately. And I'll, if I can't explain the process we use, hold me accountable. That's how that piece works. But you don't get to second guess the decision that gets made on the administrative side when we've agreed that that's an administrative decision. I, I feel passionately about that piece, but like I heard from the community, they are not disappointed with the decisions that have been made. They're just, they have concerns about the how. We can fix the how. The how is actually pretty easy. I, I know we can get to that one pretty quick. What concerns do you have about this position? What do you expect to be your greatest impediments to success? And how will you overcome these challenges? Probably the first impediment I have is I'm not from Anchor Bay. I know some stuff about schools because I've done a couple things, but I have not done things in Anchor Bay. I am clearly an outsider if you hire me. And that means I got some learning to do. I, I think I've explained you how I go about it, but that is clearly an impediment. It's clearly a challenge for me, okay? I'd also tell you this, here's another impediment. I've never been a superintendent before. You know, that's not, you've seen my resume, all right? But like, I haven't sat in that chair before. I think I've done the things to be prepared to sit in that chair, but I haven't sat in that chair before. What are some of my concerns? Are we, and that's a collective we, are we prepared to make sure that we are going to make decisions that support kids and that are about kids and not about adults and not about adult stuff? And that is, that's a concern I have. You know, there. Google Anchor Bay and pick a word schools in particular. And there are times when there's been too much adult stuff that I can find on the internet. And I, you, you wanna be a school district that doesn't have adult stuff pop up. Everyone has something, right? Like you can Google gross point and find some adult stuff. Like everybody has adult stuff, stuff's gonna happen. You've got 300 and some teachers, you've got about 600 employees, you've got you know, 6,000 kids, stuff's gonna come up. But man, we got to work hard to have as little adult stuff as we possibly can because that becomes the narrative. And that's just a concern. I think you're committed to it. I'll tell you, I've been watching this process, not the live feed of other people, other people interviewing, but like I've watched you as board members. I've watched your last four months of board meetings plus a couple of other board meetings. And then I've sat here twice and I watched last Friday when you picked candidates. You have been, by every definition, a highly functional board during that time. You agreed to a process. Mr. Silveri organized it. You've stayed within your confines. You've asked the right questions. You also haven't asked the deeply personal questions that he told you publicly. You can't ask some of the questions because that would be a violation of law. You've followed along and done all those things. You guys have demonstrated you can follow process. I'm excited about that part. The, I think those are the pieces we're looking at. Thank you. What are, what are your remaining career aspirations? If you are offered this position and accept, how long might we expect you to stay? So Mr. Richards, by asking me that question now, I got to rethink my closing statement because now I got to give part of my closing statement right now, okay? What are my aspirations? I'm ready to be a superintendent. I've been an assistant superintendent or deputy superintendent since 2008. I have had the blessing and the opportunity to work with great leaders, great colleagues. I wanted to be a superintendent back in 2010, um, applied for a handful of superintendencies, always made the finals and never, the, never got the job. Like I was always the bridesmaid, never the bride. And at the time, I was really sad about that and felt like, man, what a failure. I had some self-esteem issues wrapped up all in that. And I'll tell you the best thing that ever happened to me, I didn't get those jobs. 
I'm, I was not nearly as ready in 2011 when I was sitting and interviewing for jobs as I am today. I'm not fully ready yet, but like I'm a more ready person. I am, what are my future aspirations? You know, everybody when they're little always get asked, what do they wanna be when they grow up? And I told you before, if you'd asked me five years ago, I would have said, I wanna be the deputy superintendent. And I was happy doing it in Gross Point. And a couple of years ago, I, I realized I got one more step. 48, I'm gonna work another 10 to 12 to 14 years and being happy doing it. I'm healthy, so I know I can do that. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a runner, exercise guy that like really is passionate about taking care of myself. So I have no doubt that I'll be able to take care of myself that way. I've got another 12 to 15 probably years of work left in me. I've loved being in one place for nine years. I'd like to be in another place for nine or 10 years. I'm not looking to hop superintendencies. If I'm the next superintendent in Anchor Bay, I'm staying long-term unless you guys tell me I gotta leave. Tell me I gotta leave, I can figure something else out. So this is where I mess with the closing. It was interesting, except for the students. Every group of adults today wanted to ask, hey, John, yeah, you want to be here in Anchor Bay, but you're a finalist in Gross Point. Tell me about that. Like, and I'm sure Mr. Silveri, he asked me that question because you guys were going to ask him that question. And I brought it up before, and I guess I'm going to do it again. I'm ready to be the Anchor Bay superintendent. I'm ready to be a superintendent, but I'd like it to be here. You guys offered me the job today. I say yes, and I'm all in. You guys offered me the job next week. I say yes, I'm all in. You offer me the job on May 12th, I say, yes, I'm all in. I'm committed to doing it here. At the same time, if you decide to take six weeks and transparently Gross Point offers me that position, I'm gonna have to say yes to them. I'm excited that your timeline is currently ahead of their timeline. I'm ready to say yes. I know I probably gotta wait to the 12th to get an answer. You guys wanna move it up, like I'm all for it, okay? But I know process, like there's this process guy telling you, well, now you should break process. I'm not telling you to break process. It wouldn't be sad in that case you broke process. I can be patient till the 12th. You guys offer it to me on the 12th. I say, yes, I'm your superintendent and we get to be together as long as you have me for probably ballpark 10, 12 years, and we figure it out together. And that way, at 10 or 12 years, I'll ask all of you, because even Ms. Knox and, Ms. and Ms. Knox and Mr. Richards only have about six. Oh, and Mrs. Berkmeyer, which one of you are, all three of you are brand new, aren't you? So you each have six to go? You've got all six to go, right? So I could outlast all three of you, hopefully not. Like, hopefully you all run for re-election or are foolish enough to become a support board member for 12 years straight. That would, be, that would be like my best possible outcome. And thanks for taking my closing away from me. Now I got to frantically think of a new one. Thank you. Final question. There is no more important or impactful decision for a board of education than selecting its next superintendent. If we were to choose you, what is it about your leadership that would cause us to reflect five years from now and consider this to have been the best decision we could have possibly made? Five years from now, you reflect back. We've all grown old together. I have way less hair. Like that's common every day, it feels like. And you reflect back and say like, what would be the best possible outcome? Hire and John brought us together. I think that's it. We were a district that had these great resources, this great thing, great opportunities but hadn't quite put it all together. We'd had kind of a messy last six to nine months, maybe a little longer, you know, messiness on board members, you know, things moving around, complicated elections, board roles shifting, superintendent, long-time superintendent leaving, kind of messy, complicated labor relations, all under the cloud of COVID, closing a building. It was like this dark time, but then, we came together, we being you, came together, listened to our community, worked with inside of a process. John came in and said this stuff, which you must've liked because you hired me, right? So I'm gonna say I said the right stuff, right? And he was true to his word, he brought us together. We had, he had integrity. He cared a ton. Nobody worked harder than him. Nobody listened harder than him. 
and nobody challenged us politely, positively, not like challenged, like I'm going to fight you, but like challenged us to get better. And we at Anchor Bay are better because of the decision that this board made in 2000, in May of two, April of 2021, ends up being the best possible decision that we could have made. And that's like the second half of my closing and now I really got to work at it, man. Do you have any um, questions quickly that you would like to ask the board? So you're probably gonna laugh and say you can't do this, but I'm gonna open it up in a way that Mr. Severi will throw something. He's my old boss, so he can chew me out in the hallway. He told you, because I watched it on TV, you can't ask like a whole bunch of different strange questions. So I'm gonna give you, open it up to you guys a little bit this way. Is there something you expected me to talk about? Or is there something that you are surprised I didn't talk about that like is almost eating at you? Like you're gonna go home and say to your significant other, like, man, I like that John guy. But he didn't, like not what I said, but like he never even brought up this thing, right? Is there something that we haven't talked about in the two and a half hours we've been together that you're wishing right now you'd had a chance, I'm opening it up, I don't care what it is, I'll be happy to talk about it for a second. And that might be too vague, and you might just stare back at me like, I don't know what that is. Okay. I can take this like really good or really bad, but like I'm gonna take it as really good that I asked a miserable question, right? And maybe that's okay that I, I apologize if I asked a miserable question. Been here for five and a half hours, my brain's slightly fried and he took me out to dinner and I ate way too much. So like I might need to take a nap at some point. Okay. I, I would just say that I think you, you hit on everything and you hit on the stuff. You obviously researched the board and the, the district, you hit on a lot of stuff that was, that's been going on and you gave us some answers of what you would do if you were uh, hired. So I thought you did. It was good. Thank you, Mr. Jabir. I appreciate that. Uh, I also agree that you hit on things. Um, I didn't expect you to hit on watching the board meetings the last six to nine months um, and bringing that up because that could be a little touchy. It could be. But I think it was very beneficial. Thank you. That we know that you see what's going on and that we you know can all move forward and uh, and we have been you you said that as well that this has been a great process so i do appreciate you bringing that up um even though it could have been a little sensitive but i don't think it was thank you i appreciate the feedback i can sleep tonight because i was worried about that one <laughs> okay um so I, I know we sort of ruined it, but do you have any other closing no. remarks? That you I do, like okay. And it was actually, you didn't all ruin it. It was Mr. Richards and Mrs. <laughs> Knox, right? Like I had the whole, like, I'm gonna answer the gross point question. And then like, I'm gonna get somehow into like why you should hire me. And so like, you both had to do that to me, right? But I can make this work. So I'm gonna, I hope that you think of me, like when you, if we never see each other again, which would be really unfortunate. But like, if we never see each other again, I hope that you take away, he cares a lot. And I'm an optimist. I'm a positive person. And I'm convinced through honesty, integrity, perseverance, and being willing to talk about the hard stuff, a little bit like what Mrs. Knox was saying, man, any organization can thrive. And this organization is not broken. You know, it's just not. I mean, I didn't see bitter staff members today at all. I saw people that care about kids. I see seven board members. Well, I, tell you, I see five. I've heard Mr. Middlestat and I apologize to Mr. Moses. Like I haven't seen him. Like it'll be really awkward. Like if I do get the job, I've never met one of the seven people, right? That's okay, right? But like, so I, but even the board, you guys care a lot. You're committed to doing this the right way. I will, if I don't get the job, I'll have appreciated like the day and a half or however many hours it's been I've spent here. And I'll reflect back five, five years from now, if I don't get the job, I'm gonna still think really highly of Anchor Bay. I will continue to think you probably made a mistake, <laughs> but that's like human nature, right? I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that, right? But I am excited. I wanna work with you. I wanna say yes. I wanna get started. I'm, I couldn't, I wasn't sure when I talked to Mr. Severi a month and a half ago. 
I was a little more sure when I applied. I felt good last Thursday. That feels like a lifetime ago. I felt really good today during the stakeholder meetings. In this meeting with five of you face-to-face, -face, Mr. Middlestat, Mr. Moses, wherever you're at, I know he's at work. I feel really good about this. And I hope you've got a smile behind that mask, even if it's the smile of never seeing that dude again. I do hope that, I think you got a smile. I've enjoyed my time and just a sincere thank you for having me. Well, we sincerely appreciate your time as well and your continued interest in being uh, our next superintendent. We will continue to keep you apprised um, throughout the rest of our decision making and we would expect to be prepared with the final determination soon. Uh, best wishes, of course, and thank you for interviewing and your time spent in Anchor Bay today as well. All right. Thank you. Okay, um, so board members, um, and I did get a chance to talk to Mr. Moses on um, his preferences. We do, um, and Mr. Silveri will join us again shortly. Next week, we were planning site visits um, with both of the candidates. Of course, those dates are dependent on which three board members are attending and what, you know, what times can be made to work among those three people. Um, so, like I said, um, talking to Mr. Moses, I can share that he, you know, while he said he would be interested in doing such, he said, you know, if there's three people that can make, you know, share their time, I can, he said he could bow back. Um, so I'll kind of open that up. And Mr. Middlestad, I, I know I can't see you, but, um, you know, jump in as well. I don't know what your, you know, work, family, life situation is if you're interested. Um, and if anybody wants to speak up, um, who is interested at this point in moving, possibly doing site visits with both candidates. Um, Mr. Silveri did share with me that those would be about four hours typically, each. Typically, you would look at uh, four hours in each district, separate days, typically. If there's a need for you to approach it differently, we could talk about that now too, but that's what normally happens. So it's a big commitment. Two days next week, four hours, add drive time. It's asking a lot, I know, but it's uh, it's important. I would uh, be interested in doing that. Okay, Mr. Middlestat, were you going to speak? Yeah, I would, I would. I would not be able to participate. Okay, thank you. Also, can I please be excused? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. All right, thank you. I've got another commitment at eight, so thank you. Okay, thank you. I would be available um, and, and definitely willing to go. I think on Tuesday, I have a track meet. I need to be back for by four o'clock. Um, if I'm a little late, you know, we can record it. So that's not a huge issue, but I've already checked my schedule and I'm available. Okay. I'm also, I am available both days. Okay. You are available? Yes. Can you tell us, Mr. Saveri, a little bit about what actually is going to take place on these on these visits? Absolutely. I provide guidance to the candidates, which basically is they need to arrange for the board members who um, come onto the site to have the opportunity to meet with various groups of stakeholders that are as broadly representative as they can make it. So you're talking to two um, deputy assistant superintendents. So you would expect to talk to the superintendent in that district, for example, perhaps members of the board, members of the administrative team, other members of the staff, et cetera. I try to give them the latitude and say, so if you get a four hour block of time, you wanna chunk it out 30 to 40 minutes maybe per group. And depending on how many groups you wanna have and how many folks you wanna be there, but you all need to walk away, those participating feeling like you had an unrestricted opportunity to interact with these people. You were able to talk to, you know, again, broad representation of the stakeholders in the district. 
and come away with a, a good a, a feeling that you were able to get a true representation of these people from the people they work with and for, right? So um, again, I gave them a little bit of latitude, but what you could expect is they would have a schedule set up, which you would get in advance. So you would know going in, here are the groups of people we're gonna be meeting with, here are the times. And I can provide you and Will with some basic starter questions to help you out, but you literally would have the opportunity to ask anything that you would like to within legal means, of course. Um, but it's also an opportunity to, if there are any remaining questions, doubts, or just things that you wanna reinforce, things that you think you believe that you, you know about these people, but you'd like to hear it from their home district just to be sure that you're reading them correctly and that what you believe to be true really is true, if that makes sense. So it, it does sound like we have three board members that are interested. Um, so therefore I will bow out of the process if we've got three that are interested. Uh, the only thing I wanna make sure is that we have the same people going to both visits, you know, so they have that ability to prepare. Uh, and right now I probably have a little bit of luxury. Uh, I may not be exactly dressed appropriately, but I on short <laughs> notice I could fill in if somebody had something come up, please call me. Uh, again, I may be in shorts and a t-shirt, but at least we'll have somebody there. So. Uh, I could do, I could be a stand-in if necessary. Okay. Um, you know, as board president, I had already kind of decided in advance that I was going to bow out of this um, and let, you know, other board members go ahead. So at this point, I mean, it looks like Mr. Drew, Ms. Knox, and Mr. Richards um, will be the ones going forward. Um, I would like to offer up um, as a new board member, if uh, Ms. Berkmeyer, you think it's more appropriate to have Mr. Green go? I'll happily bow out. He has more experience. And um, if you think that would be more beneficial. I'll, I'll interrupt. This is commonly called the bait and switch. <laughs> uh, Mammy had your hand up. You volunteered. We called on you. You're up. But thank, okay. you. thank you. I, I appreciate it. You let you. me know if you have any questions and we'll be sure that the three of us yeah tackle everything that everyone's looking for then. Very good, thank you. I am confident that the three of you will be just <laughs> fine. So may, may I ask this, it may be premature to ask this, but um, typically then, and this is the order that we do this, you have to identify the three board members first, and then um, based on their calendars and what they were available to do, you tell me which two days would work for you in which four hour blocks of time within business hours, like between nine and four would work. And then I'll share that with the candidates and, and get those candidates scheduled, give them their day, um, ask them to create a schedule and get that to you prior to the day that you'll be going along again with some starter questions for you. Are you able to do that now or do you need a little bit of time? Okay. I personally can make any day next week work, although I would prefer not Friday, May 7th. Okay. But I could still make that work if everyone else's calendar right. uh, works better. If it's, uh, if it's possible to, I mean, any day works, but if you can keep it to Tuesday and Thursday, that would be the ideal. But as long as I know this week, I'm good on any day, but okay. does Tuesday and Thursday work for you guys? Yes. All right, so Tuesday the 4th and Thursday the 6th. And what about the time frame? What about the four hour block of time? I would ask for on Tuesday, because we do have a track meet at four o'clock. Um, I have a track kid, I, I don't run. Um, <laughs> that we, if we could get out a little bit earlier to make it back here in time. You know, I would on appreciate Tuesday that. and Thursday, I'm, I'm good at any time. Like again, as long as we're gonna schedule it right now, I can put that in and I'm good, so whatever you guys. Yeah, other than that, if we can make that work, I would appreciate it. If not, we can, we can, I can make do. Well, so you tell me, so, uh, so what morning. would be a comfortable ending time for you to be done with the site visit on that day? Are you saying Tuesday? Yeah, three o'clock. Oh, easy enough. I mean, yeah. for example, if you wanted to even have to cut it too close, you could say that you would go from uh, 10 to two, just as an example. I There's... think that would work very well for me. On both of those days? Yeah. That works for me. Nine to one would be better for me. Nine to one? Nine to one. Okay with you too? Yeah, that's fine with me. 
So nine to one on Tuesday the 4th and Thursday the 6th. I will, of course, let you know where you're going, which of those days I'll get a, uh, the place that you need to get to so that you have that, the starter questions. Perfect. And if you have any questions um, at all if that I haven't been able to answer, once I provide all that information, if there are still remaining questions, let me know. In addition to providing the three visiting members, mm -hmm. will the whole board get that so that they know if there's questions they want to build upon? Absolutely, okay. yes. Yeah, I, I always follow that rule that uh, I, I communicate with all of you. So um, even those members who aren't attending are going to get the same message. I'll also include the exact message that I'm giving to the candidates so that you know what kind of direction I gave them in terms of planning for it because then you'll be able to see how they carried that out when you go. Okay. Okay, and the very last thing. So then just know that the other commitment that you're making is once you've conducted both of the site visits that you will um, create a, a, a kind of a summary for your board colleagues, the other four members of the board, not a recommendation, not we liked, you know, we now want to pick this person over this one because of what we saw and heard, but just a really kind of basic, here are the things we saw and heard um, in Armada, here are the things we saw and heard in Gross Point. Do we do that as a, as a group then, you're saying, or we oh, do we recommend? I, I will say this, so we recommend that if you're able to consult um, because I think what's most valuable for the other four board members is you're sharing the things that you agree on. Yep, these are things that we all agree we saw and heard. We have a common perception. That's why it's ideal to have the same three people go to both. So to the extent that that's possible, that's ideal. If you absolutely couldn't and had to do something individually, you could do that. Uh, I, we don't recommend that. Don't think it's quite as helpful. So if you're able to consult and do that together, that would be perfect. Well, I would think with since there's three of us, obviously we can meet outside of a board yes. meeting. So yes. maybe after those two days, the three of us can set a time that we can meet and yep. set that up. Yep. Perfect. And you want to do it soon enough, knowing that you're coming back together the following week to uh, to make your decision. And what what day is that the following week? It's the 12th, like what the, day of the week? We, the it's a Wednesday. It's our Wednesday. regular scheduled oh, yeah, board yeah. meeting. Okay. And if might as well go there too, because we're talking about process, the very last step. So on the 12th, we may have talked about this before to reinforce it, like we've been doing along the way with the process, we would look to each of you to weigh in and say, all right, having considered everything now, all this data we have now on these candidates, here's who I would like to see us select as superintendent, and here's why, in, in a positive way. And again, refraining from making any negative comments at all about either candidate. Once the seven of you have had the chance to weigh in, a consensus should be clear. You'd be able to make a motion and take a vote. One thing I'd like you to think about, and I'll reinforce this in writing, is given that you will have had the chance to express your opinion. So suppose you say, here's the candidate I would like, but ultimately when all seven people have weighed in, it's clear that the consensus lies with the other candidate, right? What I would hope for, and it's a great sign of support, if you know the decision is going the other way, you will have already had a chance to express publicly what your thoughts are, so you're being honest about it. But what was really great, a, a great step to pull everybody together at that point, is if you're able to go ahead and support the motion, even if that wouldn't have been your first choice. A 7-0 vote for something like this is ideal. Do you have to do that? Of course not, right? You have free will, you can vote any way you want to. I'm simply suggesting that um, you want the relationship with the new superintendent to get up to a great start. Um, really, I would say it's much like you did when you narrowed the field down to the two finalists. It wasn't unanimous, but what you we heard people say was, well, this may not have been my top two, but I can absolutely support the two that the, the, the majority had selected, and it was a 7-0 vote. So I think if you can replicate that with this big final decision, that would be ideal. Any other questions for me about remaining steps? Thank okay. you. Thank you, sir.
All right, we will open it up to open forum. Um, Mr. Sizemore, if you could let me know if there's any virtual submissions. There is not, no. All right, thank you. I will accept a motion to adjourn. I'll move to adjourn. I'll support that, sir. I'm going to get this right today. So there was a motion by Mr. DeRue and supported by Mr. Green. Um, get it right. <laughs> Mr. Middlestamp bowed out. So I will just call the roll. Um, Mr. DeRue? Yes. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Richards? Yes. Ms. Knox? Yes. And Ms. Berkmeyer? Yes. All right. Um, meeting adjourns at 826. We have a regular scheduled board meeting tomorrow night. Um, same time, same place, seven o'clock. And um, so the, and the agenda should be, is posted. Um, so we will be back to our regular scheduled meetings.